My special guest today is Cynthia Figgy. She's the co-founder and CEO at CSR Hub. Cynthia is a forerunner, entrepreneur, and thought leader in the corporate sustainability movement. Cynthia is CEO and co-founder of CSR Hub, a leading big data, environmental social governance, ESG, information platform. CSR Hub provides consensus ratings on the performance of 28,000 companies worldwide and serves the corporate, financial, advisory, and academic sectors and API partners. Cynthia co-founded Ecos International in 1996, one of the first consulting consult, consultancies integrating sustain, sustainability and corporate strategy. Cynthia has worked with major organizations, including Boeing, Coca-Cola, Dow Jones, and REI to help craft sustainability strategy integrated with business. Cynthia is a national speaker on trends in ESG, corporate social responsibility, CSR, social impact, and business intelligence, and she's got an MBA from Harvard Business School. Cynthia is located in Seattle, and welcome to the show, Cynthia. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to hear about uh, CSR Hub. I hear about CSR and ESG all the time. It's in the news. My company, Trinia, talks about it a lot. So would you just tell our listeners um, a little bit about your background, how you came to be involved in this industry, and what CSR Hub does? Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, um, for for many years, I was involved with uh, startups, turnarounds, working with uh, often very large companies that were creating new uh, new ventures, but I always had a passion for sustainability. And I had the very good fortune, I was um, working with Macaw Cellular uh, when they sold the company to AT&T, and that gave me an opportunity to uh, start something on my own and really pursue this dream of helping companies integrate sustainability into their core business strategy. And it was really early. And let me just say, it was probably you know, too early. Uh, but <laughs> um, so there I was in 1996, um, trying to explain to people that this was much bigger than uh, uh, recycling and um, you know, some of the ways that uh, we were thinking about um, these, these issues back then. I started consulting, and after working with companies, uh, really vanguard companies who were market leaders, uh, we started helping them develop their first corporate social responsibility reports. And that gave me an inside view into how do we start to think about these uh, very, all these issues, how do we measure them, how do we capture those metrics, how do we publish and share that, and then how do we start getting feedback on how are we doing? Mm. So uh, that's really, I think, the genesis for CSR Hub. Um, after doing that for a number of years, I began to realize that uh, there were a number of raters out there who were evaluating companies and trying to assess their performance. Typically, those, those companies were small, uh, kind of Wall Street analyst-type companies, but they were serving socially responsible investors, and um, as such, it was it was kind of a uh, a you know sort of a part of the whole investing community. But it was a you know it was a small part. Uh, but we started there, and we started looking at what was the data that they were providing to investors, and how were companies getting their hands on it. And so that was kind of the beginning. And, and it's really it's really taken off, and it seems that there are a lot more investors that need this information now, and that's kind of driven some vindication for 1996, Cynthia, uh, who, who is now at the center of this. It's just, it's grown to be a huge industry. Can you talk about that growth and like the, what your data sets look like now that you're collecting on the platform? How has that changed, and, and where has it gotten to? Well, you know, when you think about, uh, and I started CSR Hub, it was late 2007, and we started with one data set, um, and then the, our second and our third, and we started licensing these, these data sets that no one else was getting to see because they were, by and large, direct, directly competitive, competitive with one another. So we started comparing and building. Within a few years, we really had the, the making of big data. 
Um, of course, it has grown so much. We're now we've we've probably aggregated over 800 sources uh, since we started. Uh, we 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 were rating a few thousand companies, and now we're actually covering 50,000 companies worldwide. The data has changed as well. Um, we're licensing data from some of the leading providers in the market, MSCI, ISS, S&P Global, uh, Moody's, and others. And in addition to all of that licensed data that we ingest, and we don't share, we don't pass that data through, but we, we have the, the sort of the privilege of seeing all of that underlying data and making, making sense of it and, and you know, normalizing the data, weighting it, uh, aggregating it. But in addition, we're adding many, many really uh, wonderful uh, stakeholder data sets as well. These can be best of lists, indexes. They could be um, uh, organizational membership lists, um, special research, you know, everything we can get our hands on that covers ESG, we're uh, trying to, to get in under the hood. And um, today we have about 350 million data elements. Um, and that, that depth and breadth really enables us to fully rate so many companies and compare them. So essentially what we're doing today is we're a massive benchmarking tool providing the strongest signal of perceived performance, um, and it's a consensus score. And so uh, companies can really get a sense of where are they at, how do they compare, uh, where are they going. Wow. That big data is such a challenge to wrangle, and it is, it's fascinating to me that it went from nobody's interested in this, this doesn't, it isn't a thing, to the being yeah. to the point where there's so much information and so much interest, the best way to make sense of it is to condense it into a score. And yeah. it, it sounds like that's the primary benefit that your users are getting is that it's it's easier for them to understand all the different factors that go into ESG in a single score. Is that the way to think about it? Yeah, I think that's that's uh, you know that's a that's the real base case is benchmarking and really being able to compare. We have a, a schema that has remained very uh, solid over the years, and what we do is we we um, we score three dimensions of environmental uh, performance. We actually have uh, two pillars under social community, uh, which is outward looking, and then employee uh, inward looking, and then governance. And so we actually have 12 uh, subcategories that we're rating companies. And then we also rank, so there's an absolute score on how a company is, is performing. Um, and, you know, the sort of the, it's, it's not an average, big data doesn't, algorithms don't yield an average, but the, the midpoint, if you will, is 50. Um, and so we see a, a, a curve, you know, we don't see a lot of companies under 35 or much above 75, but then we also rank companies and we compare them to how they're performing in the world, their country and their industries. So, um, that's really helpful too. Yeah, so you get the, it's a scale. You get a scale it's and a, a ranking. Yeah. And the folks that are taking that scale and ranking, is it um, split between companies that want to see how they're doing to measure their own performance and investors that want to invest socially responsible? Um, or is it skewed towards one or the other? It's actually the three major markets that we're serving are, are corporates. So they're primarily using it for internal competitive research. Um, but that has that has changed as well. So some, sometimes I'm seeing companies now using the data for an outside-in view on their suppliers. They're trying to assess the diversity or the ESG performance of their supply chain. And we're really good at, at top spend uh, and looking at critical uh, suppliers. Um, the, sec the second uh, big market for us is consulting firms. So we work with consulting firms, you know, small uh huge, uh, everything in between, because, you know, they're really trying to find uh, business intelligence tools to help their clients fundamentally improve. And that's, that's, the, that's the game. You know, uh, everyone wants to improve their performance, improve their ratings. It's a virtuous circle. Uh, the third market are investors. So we do serve investors directly, and we can go down markets. So we, we have some, uh, some small investors and also some very large investors. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, those three markets. But the use cases have proliferated tremendously. I was just on a call with a consulting firm 
where they're looking at how can they use the data for engaging their clients, but how could they rate their clients? Um, how could they determine how, how their clients, the journey, and, and how to assess it? Uh, they want to also look at their supply chain. They also do want to do internal um, research. And, and so there's, there's, uh, there's just a lot of ways uh, that people are using the data, credit, credit analysis, risk profiling, um, and, of course, portfolio management. Wow. So people are getting creative and, and this is starting to work its way out into all kinds of different use cases. Do you think that that's being enabled because you've made the data so accessible? I'm on your website. I can see um, if you're following <laughs> along at home at csrl.com, um, but you've got really easy ways to get the data via API. You can go through a partner. It's very accessible and you can start with the consensus ratings and the kind of synthesized rankings, but you can also dive in deeper into the data and that flexibility right. and excess seems to me to lend itself towards creativity. You can do more because the data is available. Do you think that's changing things? Do you think that's true? I, I do. I will, at least I hope, uh, I hope that's what we've enabled. I mean, we're a B corporation. One of our, our strong goals has been providing access and you, you really nailed it, Andrew. I mean, think when we started this, it was, it was hard to get all of this in one place. It was hard to understand the feedback and, um, and use the data. So, you know, we, we hope that by making it more accessible, transparent, developing tools where people, you know, we use Excel, you know, and uh, a lot, you know, most people can, you know, struggle with it or use Excel pretty well. But, but then for power users, we have an API. And as you mentioned, we're also partnering with organizations that have used the API to create their own products on their own portals. We released um, a product or Broadridge, uh, a fintech company, uh, released a, a product on their own uh, corporate issuer portal that enables their their clients to access the, this data right you know right within that user environment and it's really great because of that integration. Wow. Yep. I I can relate to enabling innovation. It's a good feeling and it sounds. Like, I bet your answer is going to be yes. But I you've got this mission right. You you think this this data and can actually do some good in the world. It's spreading everywhere. It's prolific. There's tons of sources. You're 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 condensing it. You're selling it. You're analyzing it. And it's there's all this traction. You know, it's happening everywhere. Is that leading to the mission? Are you seeing the world changing? You know, it's kind of a cliche, but are you making the world a better place because people are looking at this data? Yeah, I, I I hope so. Again, you know, I hope so. That's that's the, that's what gets me up early in the morning, uh, and late going late at night. Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is that um, some people feel, does this data really measure social impact? Is it really telling us if we're changing the world, how much we're moving the dial? And I think um, that, you know, it's, it's a proxy for that. We hope that it gives some measure of social impact and some ability to to look at that, particularly in the mainstream, mm -hmm. because I think that yes, um, you know, some companies have uh, have been founded around a social purpose and for social change, but you know, for many many companies, um, that may not have been baked into their DNA, and but they're now really paying attention, and and this is, you know, becoming much more part of of their own mission and their own purpose. Um, for, for a number of companies, I think that we're seeing, we're seeing progress, we're seeing change. And if it's really exciting to me, you know, somebody who did go to business school and for, um, whom much of this was considered an externality, this was, you know, a lot of this stuff was considered, um, it, sort of, if you were going to take care of, of the environment, it was kind of the right thing to do. It was an, it was, it was your responsibility I, I think that's shifted a lot. I think now it's part of your core. Um, it, it's it's so integrated into what makes a great company and a really competitive company. And I think that's true on the social side as well as the environmental side. And so, you know, as we look out and see um, the the changes, you know, my my hope is that this data becomes as crucial uh, to understanding uh, performance and, and measuring it and improving it as other types of financial data. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. I think that if you measure something, that's how you can change it. And it's very easy to be critical of a category like ESG and pick one thing that maybe isn't measuring exactly what it says it's measuring. But as a but at least we're trying and now we have some insight across the broad spectrum to make sure. a difference. You mentioned yeah. you mentioned performance. So I want to talk about that a little bit more. And uh, how the de- maybe the definition of performance is changing, but like you're seeing these companies change, respond. At least there's some transparency. Is there an impact for the companies that report, file CSR reports that track these things? Do you think that at the end of the day, those companies have also good financial performance because of this? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when I when I started my consulting firm, you know, over 20 years ago. One of the things we became known for was helping companies do their first report. I mean, we literally worked with Coca-Cola on their very first sustainability report. Um, And what's fascinating to me is I'll see really big companies issuing their first reports even now, 20, you know, 20, 25 years later. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of publishing and exposing and going on the record with what's happening inside of a company. A lot of work still needs to be done around transparency and disclosure. But for for many companies, they're actually well along the journey and they're very sophisticated and there's a lot of deep work that's going on, maybe uh, much more than we can actually actually see. So I I think that everyone is kind of moving in this journey. Um, There's a lot of pressure, I think now, much more so than I saw, uh, you know, uh, years ago to uh, to at least have a starting point, disclose um, where you're at. Uh, and then there starts to be pressure, of course, on performance and improvement and setting goals. And so we're seeing now a lot more uh, pressure around net zero or setting kind of um, these ambitious goals, but goals that are achievable as well. Yeah. And when, when a company has goals or they're trying or they're making these changes, do their sales go up or do they go sideways or is it a, is it just a cost center for them? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, traditionally we thought uh, about uh, much of this stuff as being um, adding to the bot, you know, adding costs. And then I think then we, we transitioned over time to thinking about maybe th- that doing these things makes a company more efficient or takes cost out, especially as it related to energy. Energy efficiency was going to lead ultimately to cost savings. I, I think over time, um, we've started to see some top line benefits as well, because companies are forced to think about new business models, new products, innovation, and, and ESG, in a sense, the, the, those forces, those uh, forces for, for social and environmental change, they're, in a sense, spurring companies to, to deal and solve new problems. And that, that really does, does open up uh, revenue opportunity. So we're, we're seeing more of that. Um, whether or not it, how it relates directly to financial performance is still, I think, uh, you know, the jury is out. Because one of the things around sustainability that is absolutely true is it takes quite a bit of work over a sustained period of time to make a difference. And so as the market wants short-term uh, results and, and wants to look at how things are responding, Sustainability tends to um, move, I think, a little bit more slowly, and we we don't we don't see companies. It's it's just hard to to move in leaps and bounds, and so correlating financial measures with ESG becomes, I think, uh, more difficult unless you're taking a long term view. Sure. Well, if you started in 1996, maybe you can't take <laughs> a long term view. Your, your, you mentioned your website mentions the academic sector, and it makes me wonder if you're enabling some of that longitudinal research to happen. If you could, if now, you know, I can ask the question and we can say, well, maybe it's increasing performance, but it, aren't we, are we close to the point where somebody could check and, and test that? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think for for many of the analysts the, the the that are serving investors, they're trying to make help them find alpha. They're trying to actually help them improve their investing so that there are uh, rewards in the market. And you know, investing in ESG funds continues to grow. You know, almost despite performance. 
Um, so, but the academics are really cool. We, we love our academic audience. People come to us from all over the world. We can't, of course, they're, they're, they're students and they're, they're really super smart. And so they do, you know, search is really, you know, what they do. And so they find us and um, the kinds of research that we hear about is very exciting. We get a lot of PhD candidates, a lot of professors who are publishing papers and um, we try to, you know, it takes time uh, to do that research. But yeah, we're really into serving that market. That's a big, that's a really important market to us. Yeah, I love that market too. They, they're, fu- they're fun to work with because they've got so much energy for it. And then there, I feel like good research it, um, with your data actually promotes the data because then you can go out and say, yeah, there is alpha here or there isn't. And it's good for your business. Um, yeah. What's next? I mean, you've got this big platform. What are you going to, what is CSR going to, the hub going to build next? But also, where's this industry heading? Well, a couple things. One is that I wanted to mention one more thing that we have an API. We had an API really early on. And um, that's something I think we have in common with Intrinio. Uh, we, we have a developers program. So uh, folks come to us who are often, you know, pre revenue. They're, yeah, they are exploring, they're creating really creative stuff. So we get to to license our data and really see what's happening um, as people are innovating. So that's been a really a great source of uh, can, you know giving to the community, but also watching innovation uh, grow. Um, I think one of the things that we we felt is, that's been difficult in the market for for everyone, uh, but particularly I think corporates is that as they're trying to solve a multitude of problems, maybe they're trying to assess risk, that's cyber risk or supply chain risk or ESG risk, or there's a really strong need now, I think, to put the tools together and to start to have integrated solutions. So what we have found in the last couple of years is we're doing a lot more partnering. We're partnering with all sorts of organizations that um, where their clients are saying, hey, we want an ESG solution. We want to stick with our provider, uh, but we want you to also serve up ESG data. And so I see, see um, a lot of opportunity. We're part of a solution uh, with a company called Intelligize, which is part of Nexus Lexus. And they're, they're serving up some really cool products um, to, to their uh, clients uh, who are paying attention to things happening at the government level, the SEC, et cetera. As I mentioned, we're, we're partnered with Broadridge. We're, we have an app on Bloomberg. So we, we find that being able to integrate and partner with a whole variety of different providers is a really good way for people to get their hands on ESG data and to be able to, to solve larger problems. So that, I think that's one direction that we're going. Yeah. And, and do you think that that's going to further spur interest in this segment? It's kind of like seems to be snowballing. You know, if you get, if you can partner with more organizations and more places, more people can see the data, there's more investor interest and then more corporate interest. And that is just going to bring ESG into becoming a mainstream data set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, when, when we started, we could envision a lot of these end uses and these use cases and we would contact organizations and they would be just, they'd have no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> and, and, and now it's very exciting because we're, we're now, we got a lot of inbound, you know, uh, requests for partners uh, where people are looking to, to bring this kind of data into their own solutions and really um, help companies across, you know, uh, many, many dimensions. And there's just tons of pressure um, on society. I mean, there's just so many things that we're we're really uh, working to 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 do. Fundamental uh, climate change, diversity, uh, many many important social issues, social equity, uh, governance issues. So I think that you know there's there's this is not a trend, <laughs> or if it is a trend, it's not a trend that's gonna that's gonna stop. It's trending in the right direction for <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> Um, what, so I have this opinion that ESG data is more fun to look at and more fun to read about than a lot of the more traditional, you know, what's the weight of this? How much is that? It's like, it's very, would you say it's interesting data compared to a lot of the other things you could read about from a company? 
Well, I'm really biased. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I love it. I mean, I think you know, I. I, I'm one of those probably few people that actually actually read CSR reports, you know, because I actually like this stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, I do think the data is really interesting. And sometimes it's really perplexing. Like sometimes people will be very disappointed uh, if a company is not highly rated, but has a really good brand or halo effect. Or if, um, I mean, there's a pretty strong correlation between brand strength and sustainability. But not always. And um, I think that sometimes people are a little bit surprised. There may be, maybe the product is really uh, well, you know, Tesla is kind of an interesting example. We all like to, to pick on Tesla. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing company in terms of its, its product and potentially its product impact on society. But then you, when you look at the company and you drill down, you start to see, hey, this is, there are some really uneven ratings here. And so that, I think one of the things that companies find is it's not, it's a lot of work to be great mm. across the board. Wow. And, and how interesting to learn and to think about it. I, I, I believe that before too long, you're going to see this kind of information in your Instagram feed and on your TikTok and things like that, because it is it, people are fascinated by it and I, know, and I know you're biased i'm biased too because i spend my life reading financial data and thinking about data but i think everyday investors are going to get a kick out of this they're going to love yeah. learning about it and they're going to use it for investing i think that's yeah. i think that's going to happen yeah um, yeah uh, well when we started you know we were we were a little ahead like i said and we designed ways that people could have little plugins in their facebook feeds and you know and all kinds of stuff that we thought that um, but I think, you know, there's, there's just this tension between just, you know, we have an overall score, um, and it's a pretty powerful number because it's got a lot of data underneath, but it doesn't necessarily always lead you to understanding all the nuance and what's kind of under the hood and what, what might be really strong kind of traded off with things that are, uh, quite a bit weaker. So I think we're always looking for kind of the, uh, you know, the Rotten Tomatoes score, but there's quite a bit uh, uh, of depth under that. Yeah. You can't just take the average and then say, oh, this company is good or bad. You, you know, if you're if you're a murderer, right. but you donate to the animal shelter and then add <laughs> right. an equal a C. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Last question for you. If you're talking to all those MBAs out there, the people that are in business school now where you were back at Harvard and they're going to go off and be the next generation of business leaders or, you know, business students, anybody starting a company. And they're the ones who are going to make the decisions about how their company approaches ESG. What's their strategy going to be? How are they going to report it? What would your advice be to these people that actually decide the direction these companies go? What a great question. Oh, thank you. That's really nice. Um, well, I think, you know, I think partly, you know, of course, I think the consciousness level of, of students right now in business schools is, is probably pretty radically different. Um, this, like I said before, this isn't, these are no longer externalities. These aren't nice things, our, you know, our social responsibility. I think, I think people see these as, as, as wholly integrated in all the concerns that they're going to have to manage in, in running companies. And, and so one of the things I think is important is find your passion, find the, the things that you really love to do, uh, find the, the kinds of things that you want to build or, or, or sell or uh, do, and then find those avenues within those companies to really um, do that um, hard work of integration. Because in my mind, all you know, sustainability is truly integrated across uh, the enterprise, and it, it is such an integral part of operating a company and the strategy of a company. And so, I think you know, broad business experience is positive, but always looking uh, for all those ways to bring bring this in. It doesn't matter if you're going to be in marketing, finance, uh, production, you know, customer success, whatever it is. There are going to be elements of this, and so I think. Right now, like quality and like a lot of things, um, ESG has got a bit of a silo. You know, they have to, it has, it has to have dedicated people who are, have deep expertise. But we'll, I think we'll start to see that this does get 
you know, you'll see much more of it. I'm seeing this happen. It's, you know, in council, it's uh, finance has, has to worry about it. Um, the, the procurement um, operations. Uh, I remember years ago, I was sitting next to somebody uh, from, from Costco who began, it was, was traveling because they were one of the large purveyors of both chocolate and cashmere. And they were saying, you know, it is absolutely core to the business to understand environmental change uh, for us to to lead in the in in selling these products. And I mean, this is this is like one or two decades ago. I mean, and so you know, all of those linkages are really there. And and I think if I were coming out of business school today, I think there'd be. You know, the world is your oyster. Lots to, <laughs> lots to do. Yes. Lots, lots of really good work to do. I love it. Well, Cynthia, thanks for being here. The website, csrhub.com. Check it out. It was an awesome time having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much.